So we're going to talk a little bit about risky driving, uh, sleep disorders in public medicine. It came up when a couple of fellows said, well, how do I assess uh, different drivers and what do I think about generally uh, drowsy driving? And I may have given an abbreviated version in uh, July or June, but uh, I, uh, I have uh, other, other, other thoughts. I have a history of this because I've been leader of a, two groups, one in uh, 1993 and one uh, a second group from the ATS in, 1930, uh, in 2013 that has been able to kind of review this issue. So the four Ds that are the focus of uh, NHTSA, the National Traffic Safety, is drunk, drugged, distracted, and drowsy, right? So the public... Uh, public service messages that you'll hear that they put on from NHTSA. Now we'll focus on these four things. And the most recent one is this drowsy driving. And the one before that, that sort of crowded out drowsy driving to begin with was uh, distracted because of cell phones. And then drunk and drugged uh, have, uh, have been around for years. Now, let me just tell you that Drunk driving, when I was uh, started to drive, uh, it was not illegal to, uh, to, to, there was no measurement for alcohol level for drunk driving. It was only an impression by the, by the arresting officer or by the officer that was inquiring about it as to whether or not you were drunk. And, uh, and the last state to capitulate to the federal government for measuring alcohol levels at traffic stops uh, was Nevada. And uh, that was only, uh, they were fiercely independent of their right to drink and the, uh, the, the threat of the federal government was really the withholding of, of highway funds. So when you think of, of, of highway safety and uh, risky driving and sleep, you need to kind of have a history of how there are several components other than the physician that drive this, this, uh, this controversy. And that the uh, physiological sorts of things that we think about in terms of terrible sleepiness uh, may not be, may not be recognized in a public forum until uh, there are uh, important things happen to people. And in the, tr in, the, in the setting of drunk driving, the levels that you blow to be able to be legally drunk have progressively gone down over the years. We do not have a test for sleepiness. So that's, that's, that's what we do. Well, those are the four Ds. I have the disclosures, none are relevant. NIH inspire consultancies so I want to talk about, describe the neurophysiology and neurobiological exposures. And this will be very brief because each one of those topics could be long. The assessments by the physician, the patient, and the Department of Motor Vehicles, because it, it really is a, a, a group effort. It's, uh, you have a lot more people looking over your shoulder as well as you looking over their shoulder. And appreciate the mitigation of risk in special populations in the physician office. So this is from the Centers of Disease Control and the Prevention and the uh, AAA Foundation for Traffic Safety. It's a poster that was out about five, six years ago, and it really kind of summarizes all these things. And what they mean by drowsy driving is this term active sleepiness, that is, a tendency to fall asleep under circumstances in which uh, you do not want to fall asleep. And you know, that includes driving a motor vehicle. The scary facts are there are 5,000 to 6,000 fatal crashes uh, every year by drowsy driving. And that may be a, a conservative estimate, but it's a pretty reliable one now. At one time, the, the fall asleep crashes were not captured, uh, they were only captured by the term fatigue. And now that 
fatigue is, is recognized as one factor of that can be fall asleep crashes. And most states now have a tick box on the, the traffic citation uh, for drowsy driving, whereas about 10 years ago, none had a tick box and it had to be written in. So it was not captured very well. Two out of every five drivers have said that they've reported falling asleep or nodded off while driving. And that really is uh, an overall lifetime instance. And so it's really common <clears throat> to sort of say that everyone has had an experience drowsy driving, knows really how worrisome it can be, particularly if you hit a rumble strip or you hit a uh, curb and or you fall asleep at a red light. Uh, but uh, I think everybody's experienced it. And then down below 7% of all crashes, uh, 30, 13% resulted in a person being admitted to a hospital and 16% uh, of all fatal crashes involved uh, drowsy driving. So it's significant. So the, the idea of the neurobiology is really this cognitive impairment. And um, the most important metric came out in, uh, let me see what the date is, we'll show it here. 1997, uh, two British neuropsychologists did this study in which they looked at eye-hand coordination performance using a test, sort of like a PVT, a uh, psychomotor visual testing. And they did it over uh, in a, a bunch of healthy people, that is 20 to 30 to 35 year olds. And they looked at this, uh, uh, this trait, this uh, stable measure of uh, eye hand performance that is stable over time. They looked at it in people who were kept awake for 29 to 30 hours. And what you can see is that after about 15 hours or so, there is a significant uh, drop that occurs and that it falls to go to a nadir about 23 hours and then comes back up. So the first question is, uh, uh, what makes it go back up? I mean, isn't that in interesting? And we being sleep and circadian rhythm people will realize that that's the kicking in of circadian alertness uh, that comes the next day. So that's the reason for the rise at the top. People get con confused about that, or at least they wonder about that. And so the two air, uh, alcohol blood levels of 0.05 and 0.1, which kind of bracket the general drunk driving levels, they, they then tested these people, giving them amounts of alcohol that produced about that much. And they found that the impairment in eye-hand coordination was about... Uh, uh, equivalent to 17 hours of sleep deprivation or 23 hours of sleep deprivation. So we pretty well consider alcohol as an impairment in driving. We being the community, being NHTSA, being uh, uh, the, the general public. But we don't necessarily consider sleeping as being an impairment. So this is really the data that started the argument that drowsy driving is an impairment. It's an impaired driver. And that as an impaired driver, it should be treated as such. And the only conundrum is that there really is no test for drowsy driving. Now, part of the neuropsych psychology of this is that there are time on tasks, that is vigilance testing over 10 minutes uh, for a, a PVT. That is, and it's uh, faster is, is going up on the y-axis and slower is going down. So you start off and you may start off about the same level, something that really is not particularly different, but if you're sleep deprived, you decline more quickly. And uh, people who have been aware of this sleepiness uh, effect, uh, kind of play with it. I, I used to play with it on the wards in which we would we would get in a circle with all the team. And what you do is you you sort of pause for about 30, 40 seconds. And all the excitement that would uh, 
that was in that overnight call group would sort of drain out of their faces and uh, they would then compose themselves into their sleepy forms. So this has been uh, shown in a cohort of OSA patients in a simulated driving task more recently in 2018 by showing that they decline more quickly in their driving uh, task, even in a 10 or 15 minute driving task, that they would uh, decline if they were sleepy OSA patients. Now, the, the, the key there is sleepy OSA patients. And it's not as though they can be, they have OSA, it's that they are sleepy. And that's an important distinction because we have non-sleepy OSA patients. So the risk of drowsy driving is there uh, less than five hours of planned sleep. These are the known risks of planned sleep at night for at least a week. Any sedating medications or small amounts of alcohol. Driving alone for long distances without uh, breaks and the group. So these are the general risks for drowsy driving across the country. Uh, groups, males 18 to 28, shift workers are having an untreated sleep disorder. Now, this is really the, the, the kind of the, the, the priorities in which NHTSA works on. These males between the 18 and 28 are risk takers. And they more often have two jobs. They more often stay up at night. They more often have other things. They may not be aware of risks as much, but they are risk takers. Shift workers have uh, sleepiness that is imposed upon them by their work environment. And having an untreated sleep disorder is a risk, and we'll talk about that more specifically. But you notice that the, if you do the crash prevalence, and this was from uh, pack it all. This was uh, North Carolina. It's been replicated in New York. It's been replicated in other places. If you identify a fall asleep uh, car crash, which is that you drive off the road right or right, drive off the road left, and you have a failure to avoid that crash, that is, there's no skid marks, there's no evasive uh, 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 maneuvering of the car, uh, which is seen in alcohol-related crashes. If you identify those by their characteristics, you find that there's not a uniform daily uh, rate, and that that rate varies of time of day, and that the time of day that it occurs occurs more often between the, the times of about 5 o'clock and, uh, uh, eight, and 8 o'clock in the morning, and then there's an afternoon rise. And again, circadian people <laughs> will realize that, that this maps pretty nicely to our two-process model of sleep and that the nadir is occurring approximately uh, at the time of, of uh, the nadir in, in uh, your alertness and that the uh, afternoon alertness is that, that dip in alertness that occurs in the afternoon. So that the, uh, the issue here is that alcohol is different. Alcohol uh, is more often between uh, one o'clock in the morning and four o'clock in the morning, and then between five o'clock in the afternoon and seven o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, and that, that, that paper describes differences between alcohol. Was there Amen. A yeah. Uh, this is Dennis. Hey, quick question. I've always been a little... Um, bothered by this graph because these also hit with peak, you know, uh, traffic times. Are these, have they normalized for traffic? I mean, well, these were mainly, mainly on rural roads. Okay. So these were the long distance roads. Uh, other people have done that. Uh, New York did that as well. Uh, the, uh, the interesting thing, if you look at a, you look at a, uh, uh, you look at the changes in age in the elderly, there are no crashes really at night and there are lots more crashes in the afternoon. And it's because they don't drive it. So it's a sort of an interesting, uh, it's an interesting series of, 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 ide of ideas. And this article you can pull out, I think it's available. You can see the whole way that they kind of looked at this. Okay, all right, thanks. But if you look at it in isolation, you can say, yes, those are the reasons that you can think about it. 
but it maps pretty nicely. And that was really the, 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 the thought of it. And association doesn't particularly, and what you're pointing out is association doesn't really uh, mean causation. But in this instance, if you can triangulate this in a couple different ways and look at rural and urban, urban drive. Okay. So the perfect storm is insufficient sleep, fragmented sleep, circadian rhythm, and primary sleep disorders, and the active sleepiness. And all these things uh, transpire uh, 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 simultaneously in many people. And there's no often, there's no one particular, one particular feature that produces this active sleepiness, which uh, results in, in a car crash. So let's go into, into OSA and car crash. Well, individuals with OSA are at increased risk of crash. And a precise estimate is not calculated for an individual. The most common thing to say that they are going to have a crash is that they've had a previous crash. So it's sort of like a seizure. Uh, if they've had behavior that has produced a, a car crash in the, in the past, uh, and that can be any and all car crashes, that could be uh, 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 but they're specifically a, a drowsy driving, fall asleep or near miss. Hitting rumble strips is a good example. Hitting guardrails, uh, even if it's not a, a injurious accident. The crash rate is in a range of about 1.2 to 4.89, depending on the, on the cohort, the comparison cohort. And, these are, that's the range, but really 50% of patients have never had a car crash. And I think that's now starting to kind of come out with the end of types of sleep apnea in which there are people who are the non-sleepy OSA patients. And crash risk for OSA is not outside a normal national distribution. So you could say, well, it's elevated compared to non-OSA, but the people with OSA are at like the 70th percentile. The people without OSA are like at the 45th percentile, depending on the cohort. And the recognition profile for OSA per se is similar to that elsewhere. So there's no particular distinguishing feature uh, in terms of saying, do they have sleep apnea from a symptomatic point of view? Uh, is the snoring and disturbed sleep, snorts and gasping, wake time, cognitive deficits, and sleepiness. Now, most of these studies have scrubbed very nicely all other comorbidities, which we know that the sleep apnea patients, particularly in the VA, don't have a clean, clean uni unitary di diagnosis and unitary diseases. So the issue becomes... Uh, you know, what, what, how do you pick out these people? What do you do? So the, this is uh, reviewed, I think in 2010, I, I didn't go on to review it, uh, but there are eight studies of crash risk. They showed that after treatment with CPAP and one after uvopal or pharyngeoplasty, crash risk dropped and the risk ratio was significant. Daytime sleepiness improved after one night and simulated driving performance improved within two to seven days. And so the uh, idea that you could uh, treat people that were sleepy and, and actively sleepy with CPAP. Now, does this mean that all patients will improve in two to seven days? No, we know that there's a group of people that won't. But, uh, but if you take an aggregate person that presents to you with OSA and sleepiness, that you can generally say that if you, the CPAP uh, will work for your sleepiness, it will work fairly promptly. Uh, but the uh, benefits of this will continue, however, for about eight weeks to 12 weeks. But that in terms of those sorts of uh, clinical decision-making on when you're talking to someone about the impact of sleepiness for a driving risk assessment, or if you are concerned about driving, then uh, you can use these, uh, this information appropriately. AHI though is not predictive. The AHI is only predictive uh, for having a crash risk if it's over 80 and that's data from University of Pennsylvania. You, will, you, you are astonished when you hear this 
But I think the, the reason for this is again, this endotypes is that there are many people with sleep apnea, even with terrible sleep apnea, that are not terribly sleepy. And if 50% really don't have crash risk uh, or don't have crashes in their 50% don't have crashes that they report or that they, they admit to, or that they, you can show in their uh, driving, if they, you go into their driving record, that it's probably, uh, they're, they're probably, uh, uh, that's probably about right, um, is that there is a big gray zone and there's a big uncertainty zone between our diagnosis of an AHI greater than five and an AHI greater than 30 being severe and AHI of five being a definition of sleep apnea. So the high prevalence of OSA who experienced a motor crash, that's the other way of looking around it. And this is something that uh, Eric might be interested in. This is a single center level one trauma center. And uh, the other is a, a dentist. Uh, stop bang was administered in the center. It was only a stop bang, it wasn't sleep studies. 25% were at high risk for having sleep apnea. And, and those that were high risk had old, were older, had longer acute hospitalizations and a greater risk of future hospitalizations. It was generally a marker of severity. And the question for this one is, is an ascertainment bias or because of what the center was, where they were, like if they were in Cleveland or were they in Nebraska or were they somewhere else or were they in the United States or in somewhere else? This was the United States. Or is it a true finding? And is there a place for doing that? I know anecdotally, I've, I've diagnosed or taken care of or had referred people uh, with sleep apnea who had recently had a car crash, but they were generally not diagnosed by the surgeons. Uh, they were diagnosed by internists or they were, they sort of, someone finally asked them, why did you have a fall? Why did you have your crash? And they said they fell asleep. The most uh, interesting one uh, that I had it was at Metro in which a gentleman had a sternal crush injury and uh, he was complaining about his pain, particularly at night. And it was because when he had sleep apnea, he would be paradoxing his rib cage and it would be really hurting him a lot. And they gave him lots of, of, uh, of painkillers. And then he developed hypoventilation called the pulmonary consult. And, and it was pretty clear that he had sleep apnea. You put him on CPAP and it stabilized his chest wall. He had no longer pain, didn't need his pain meds. But it was interesting to sort of know that that might not be recognized in that setting. <clears throat> but as I said, the people with sleep apnea don't necessarily come in <clears throat> with, a, with a car crash only because they have sleep apnea. And these are some of the other surveys in the literature of other behavioral and comorbid conditions. And the uh, uh, short sleep, uh, less than five hours, odds ratio is 1.2 to 1.7 for having a crash risk. Shift work is 1.6, 3.23. Inattention, cell phones, the odds ratio is 22. It's now gone down to 18. Alcohol and sedating drugs, odds ratio is about six. Comorbid conditions are, 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 are there. And you know, the, the people who look at uh, crash risk looked at this data and sit there and kind of go, well, you know, how well are you, are you describing this to sleep apnea? And the people with sleep apnea say, oh, it must be only sleep apnea. And yet the uh, diabetes, depression, neurological diseases, hypertension itself is a risk. And so I think that the uh, you just have to be aware that these are other exposures that give them crash risk. Okay. So let's go on and say, oh, this is a new one that came out in 2000, 2020 out of the Sleep Heart Health. This was uh, using the, the, the five, uh, five year difference in their PSGs, looking at the, the right and left central electrodes and looking at inner hemispheric sleep depth, that is the power of the delta wave on the right side versus the left side. And there was a higher coherence of EEG powers associated with a significantly lower 
risk of a fall sleep car crash and the sleep heart health code. And PSG studies were separated by five years, showed fair to moderate stability of the of this trait, I mean the trait or the, uh, the stability. So, you know, but those are hard to go into the field and hard to do, and hard to think about. And to do that, um, all our PSGs do have power frequency analyses, and we could sort of play with that if we wanted to. But uh, yeah, I'd play with it for sleepiness in general. Okay, it's a mark, it was a marker for crash risk, and it was really in those that had the most asymmetry in their in, inner, inner hair, uh, hemispheric sleep depth, uh, sleep depth. And generally it was right, was less than, than, than left. And it was interesting. And they had a model and they had age, sex, race, BMI, miles driven, red, blue was model, usual sleep duration, AHI, interesting. Okay, so what are the responsibilities for assessing driving risk in the, and what do people expect? This is from the position statements in, 2000, in 1993 and 2013. So the physician, now remember, you do not license drivers, but you have a training uh, to assess sleepiness. You have a training to assess a sleep disorder. You have a training to assess a patient. You generally have a primary specialty and you all went to medical school. So that's important. You're able to determine the causes for drowsy driving and treatment options, inform the patient, create a plan and act as a physician. You have to know applicable state law and regulations because ignorance of the law is no excuse. Uh, a patient though has responsibilities to act as a responsible citizen. We, we really don't believe that as physicians. We think they all lie, cheat, perseverate, don't take their meds, whatever it is. I mean, I, I don't want to be flippant about it, but we, we sort of have an attitude that, that they must not be telling the truth. But they really have to accept responsibility and be an honest reporter of symptoms. And that didn't come from me. That came from the lawyers on the panel, on judges. They said that uh, the, the worst thing that a patient can do is, uh, is to lie to a doctor and mitigate their risk and go out and that that's a cause for whatever comes up in front of a judge to sit there and say, well, you know, you lied and that's it. You can't lie. The government, and you're not supposed to in a doctor-patient relationship. And the government has a non-prejudential reassessment of driving privileges. It takes responsibility to the cost administration for directors. It has a medical board. Now you won't believe it by the paper that it puts in front of you to say, can this driver reasonably drive an automobile? To which I answer, I am not trained, nor am I licensed to determine whether or not a person can uh, operate a motor vehicle. And my only, and as I go on, my only really ability is to sit there and say, this person has or does not have sleep apnea and then has or does not have sleepiness to the degree that it interferes with their activity as a result of whatever they did. Be it a tracheostomy, be it weight loss, be it sleep apnea, be it CPAP, be it oral plans, and whether or not they're adherent to whatever their, their therapy is. So it's a, it's a vicious triangle. It's a classic social triangle. And that the physician says, well, that patient is, is whatever it is. The patient's looking to the physician to let them do their job. The government is looking to the, to the, to the physician to regulate the patient's driving uh, responsibilities. And, and everyone can sort of sit there and, and, and point their fingers. And, 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 and often the physician feels like they're in the spotlight when it comes up to litigation as well. So the position paper, the answers that we had to questions. So the first question is, is OSA sleepiness associated with increased risk? Is OSA itself, and it was defined that OSA sleepiness is associated with increased risk of motor vehicle crashes. And they found there's as yet no compelling evidence to restrict driving privileges in patients with OSA if there's not been a motor vehicle crash or equivalent level of concern for increased driving risk. And that way we define that as a near miss. 
and here uh, hitting rumble strips was one example. Uh, and, and you sort of have to ask on that and you, you can ask. The high risk driver is one who is moderate or severe daytime sleepiness that is accompanied because mild daytime sleep is very common. Moderate or severe daytime sleepiness that is accompanied by a recent history of an unintended motor vehicle crash or near miss attributed to fatigue, sleepiness, or inattention. And we used all three of those terms because they're used in the traffic safe. And that treatment, yes, it can improve performance on driving simulators and might be expected to reduce drowsy, risk of drowsy driving and drowsy driving crashes. There, there is a, a, a research program in France in which they actually take OSA drivers out in a special car. Uh, they have somebody in the seat with them, but they actually take them out into traffic and they do those sim real traffic simulations. It's, I'll talk about it later, but it's estimated that a driver, uh, 22 year old, uh, well rested uh, driver makes about a thousand decisions a second about when they're driving. And they're doing that using any, you know, we, we don't even think about it, but remember the first time you drew, you drove an automobile. Boy, at the first time you drew, you drove this thing to put it in gear to get the brake working, to get the, the gas pedal going, to move the gear shift correctly, to look out the window right and left and doing all those things. Boy, yeah, now you kind of draw, jump in there and you kind of take it for granted. It's really interesting. Okay, the other thing is the answers were, what are the elements for documentation for an examination by a physician? And these documentations are during an initial assessment would include clinical severity. That is, you need to be able to know whether they're mild, moderate, or severe. I, I, uh, in looking this over, I have not gone over with the fellows an assessment of a new patient of whether or not they believe they have mild, moderate, or severe grades of clinical severity of OSA and whether or not they have a driving risk and what the type of therapy including behavioral interventions might help them. And the consideration of positive airway pressure and other therapy, adherence to therapy, response to therapy, reassessment, and whether the patient should, could be at high risk. So we'll go over what that reassessment is. But that's what you can do as a physician. And you can also do education and timely diagnostic evaluation and treatment. And it's likely to decrease the prevalence of sleepiness, uh, sleepiness related crashes in this population. Now we don't know if the elements of documentation actually do things, but the elements of documentation that were proposed in the ATS were proposed in collaboration with uh, liability lawyers, and with defense, uh, the, the defense lawyers and with, with a judge that were sitting there saying, what would they want to have in their record to show that a physician discuss this problem of drowsy driving when they were presented with a third party case. A third party case being that a patient goes out, has a fall asleep car crash, kills someone and the person that they killed, the family sits there and says, well, the, the patient really doesn't have much money, but the physician does and he had a failure to warn. So what would document a failure? What would that mean? What would that failure to warn be mitigated by, and that would be that you just document what you what you thought at the initial assessment. And since AHI doesn't really factor into this, uh, making a decision after a sleep study is not terribly useful. So the profile. So in the initial assessment, you determine whether the OSA patient is at high risk for a motor vehicle crash, and the profile is high-risk patient, moderate, severe, and, and unintended motor vehicle crash on your miss. If positive, inquiry about additional causes, sleep restriction, alcohol, sedating medications, which we do, comorbid neurocognitive uh, impairments, depression, and neurologic disorders that you can detect by clinical examination and diminish physical skills. No, there's no ESS or AHI or ODI in clinical assessment. Now you say, well, can you 
use ESS in terms of figuring out whether or not this person is really very, very sleepy? And uh, yes, you can. And that probably comes into your, your warning about sleepiness. So. Those high risk drivers with high probability, clinical severity, do you drive drowsy is probably a really good question if you wanted one question. Do you drive drowsy? And that, that, was, that kind of came out in the last review and didn't get a lot of traction. Uh, the assessment is not dependent upon outside information to be obtained later. When we discuss this, it was really important because someone said, well, how do you know, really know that they've never had a fall asleep car crash or that they really are lying to you or they really are doing? Well, it comes back to the patient being an honest reporter and that you're not really a detective and can access their driver's record at the Bureau of Motor Vehicles and you shouldn't have to do it at the time of your assessment of the patient. It shouldn't be, and, and furthermore, if there is no family member there, you shouldn't have to sit there and call them up and figure out whether this is because your Epworth is 18 or something like that. You should be able to sort of make an assessment at that time, as imperfect as it might be, that that's a reasonable, a reasonable goal for a, for a physician. To do so, that answers that. Well, what is a guy to do if they're lying to you or they're doing that? Well, you just say, Well, maybe they, you know, you just document, document the diagnostic evaluation and initiation of treatment be performed within one month rather than later. That was a weak recommendation. There really is a, a not very good recommendation, and all it is is mortality in those uh, countries in which they had at one time an 18 month delay in sleep studies. And they showed that there was perhaps an excess mortality in those that had to wait for a sleep study, whereas those that got it more in a more timely fashion, but not in terms of driving. For patients with confirmed OSA been determined to be high risk, that is they've already been determined to be high risk. You can't put a person in double jeopardy. You say, well, you're not at high risk, Oh, your sleep study showed an AHI of 60. You must be at high risk. You can't put them in double jeopardy here. You can't do this. We recommend the treatment, reduce driving risk, strong recommendation. It's reasonable to advise their patients to refrain from driving until treatment reduces risky behavior. There's no evidence. We put it in almost every one of our interpretations. We suggest educating patients and their families about the risks of excessive sleepiness and behavioral methods that reduce risk. And we suggest not using modafinil routinely for the sole purpose of reducing dry risk. There are a couple articles, uh, one, two from Australia and one from France in which they've used 200 milligrams of modafinil. Uh, and uh, driving simulator uh, shows that they can improve their driving risk without treating their sleep apnea. It's, it's, a, it's, it's something that, that our field has not has struggled with, but uh, the opposite argument is if you have pain, you give a pain reliever not knowing what the cause is. If you have sleepiness that would be with you know, high risk sleep apnea patients, why don't you give something you know that mitigates sleepiness? So, okay. Good medical practice. This is just the you know, pulmonary specialists and other health professionals with expertise in sleep apnea. You have to familiar, familiarize yourself with the presentations and complication, complications of excessive sleep. It's local and state statutes. So the, the reason we put pulmonary specialists and other health professionals with expertise in sleep apnea is at the time, and this was 2013, I uh, also did it in uh, 1993. It was if, if you were going to say, well, I know how to assess sleep apnea and I uh, am, am assessing people with sleep apnea and you then must have a body of knowledge and skill to elicit a history about sleepiness then you should be able to detect mild, moderate, severe sleepiness and you should be able to warn somebody about that. 
You may not do something about it, but you can warn them about it. And that may be physician, uh, uh, sufficient. And you, but you can't sit there and say, well, you know, that's somebody else's problem when you, when you see it. And that would, the sleep specialist can't ignore it because that's really what you do. But other, other professionals, neurologists, uh, well, we were ATS, so we said pulmonologists, so we kept it in the community. But really a psychiatrist, a neurologist, and, and even an internist that gets interested in sleep apnea, uh, uh, whether or not an oral, oral appliance of you know, orthodontist is, is relevant to this is not, not clear, but um, I, think, uh, I think that's really, really why they're there. And the California and Arizona were such states that had compulsory, compulsory reporting. We don't have compulsory reporting. Other countries struggle, European Union on driving risk, uh, uh, retention of driving light. They say it should be retention of driving uh, requires assessment of sleepiness, adherence to continuous positive airway pressure. They ignore the other therapies. Uh, there's no remains uncertainty in the optimal methods of assess sleepiness on large scale. And that's really the issue about how do you predict these things. So I'm going to go on and talk about two special cases. One is the CDL, the commercial driver's license. We get the guy comes in, he says, oh, doc, you know, I got, I got this thing. My CDL driver gave me this and said, you know, just give me a letter. Just give me a letter so I can drive my truck. Well, let me give you a background of it. The reason that truckers are special are because truck insurance claims, the example is 2009 Australia, but it's relevant now and other people have talked about it in lectures. At that time, it was $3.5 billion US total truck insurance claims. Five to six percent were drowsy driving, that was conservative. And it's about $1.5 million per occurrence of a drowsy driving fall asleep crash. So every time you go by one of those trucks, it's by the side of the road, you, you can sort of go, boop, there's another 1.5 million. And that's including everything, including uh, liability, death, injury to others. So in the, in the US federal, in federal uh, guidance for states, the CME examination is based on numbers, not symptoms, and it has about 14 conditions. It includes uh, blood pressure includes uh, epilepsy, it includes uh, diabetes, it includes all sorts of things. So the high licenses, however, of 300,000 truckers a year. And, up, and Ohio has one of the highest obesity rates. And so you can see that uh, if you have a history of OSA, NERC circumference of 17 to 18 inches, a BMI greater than 35, we, it requires an assessment by a specialist. The truckers hate this, mainly because if they don't have health insurance, they got to pay for all this. So they do all sorts of things to get around this. And your role really is to confirm, confirm feedback. The dog's next door or out, and my dog's get excited. I'm sorry. So you need to confirm the diagnosis, confirm the effects on alertness. Sure, one can do testing, but does it really predict? If I do a an, uh, maintenance of wakefulness test on Thursday, does it mean that two weeks from now after the, the trucker has had, uh, you know, three nights of a bad marriage or three nights of a, of a sick kid or something like that, uh, that a, they won't have a, a, a drowsy driving? Uh, event, you can't. Download adherence, confirm therapy, report your expertise. One cannot say the driver is competent to drive a truck or a bus. And, and, and then the, the pushback says, well, why can't you? You say, well, you know, what do you do to assess a driver can drive your bus or your truck? And you say, well, we do a driving test. You say, well, I don't do driving tests. I don't get up there. I don't see what they do. I don't know how they do it. I mean, if I got in there, it'd be like driving a car for the first time. And so you want me to assess what they can do? No, you assess what it is using your usual professional 
things. Now for the trucking it's, it's, and, and bus driving, it's easier because they have people that do that. You usually have a driver that watches, uh, they, a, a, a driver sitting there, observer that watches the driver for some period of time. And they have medical boards that can tell them that as well as union boards and professionals. So airline pilots are the second. Each pilot has his or her own physician who's the gatekeeper for every condition. And there are guidelines available to the physician for sleep disorders for that physician. Uh, the commercial medical examiner will, or the, 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 the aviation examiner will refer for diagnosis. And each year expect a visit by the patient to a physician to confirm the diagnosis of adherence and effect. And some of you guys have seen the letters I put out. I said, well, he came in today. His adherence is here. His sleepiness is within the range of, of a normal population. I don't really tell him what it is. I just tell him it's in the range of a normal population. The ESS is less than 11. Everybody goes, oh, they're always less than 11. Well, that's your bias. That's your bias to say they're all lying. But generally, they're pretty... They, they know that they know the problems of sleepiness and then um, now the pilots know all these guidelines so what do they do well many pilots that have sleep apnea um, uh, if they're if they're thin and they really don't meet these sort of obvious criteria that are in the truck driver stuff which they don't they they have certain weight they have certain height weight bmis things of that sort and they know they have sleep apnea. They go to a private sleep lab, get diagnosed and treated, and, and their name is, is never found in there. It, it, it never comes up in insurance. So there's a there's a there's a, a famous sleep lab down in New Orleans, which was a former bed and breakfast that these guys go to. And they were uh, interesting, interesting little culture. So they all need education. And they need personal warning signs, um, falling asleep in low need alertness settings. Hopefully no one fell asleep this morning. Feeling restless, irritable to staff. Having to check yourself repeatedly, missing checkpoints or accidents. Uh, having difficulty focusing on driving tasks. And uh, feeling like you don't really care. That's an important thing we found with uh, interviews with uh, house staff. Uh, failure to warn, especially without documentation, a sleepy patient sets you up for a third party blend. Okay. So I've got some interactive questions, uh, but I'll pause here for, uh, for any particular comments or questions about what I just presented. King been a while back, I remember hearing about uh, doing like real time monitoring of truckers. Yes. Wearing portable devices while they were driving to see if they were having lapses and things like that. Did, did, any, did that ever get any traction? Well, it didn't get traction in terms of the routine assessment of trucking. It did yeah. get uh, attention. Uh, and there is a YouTube video of a truck driver driving for approximately six seconds in slow wave sleep during a, a, along a stretch of Canadian highway. Uh, doing quite well. But then there are other uh, YouTube videos of, uh, of people that were monitored for sleepiness. And you can see that they're falling asleep and they have crashes and the crashes are terrible. But in terms of monitoring people in real time, uh, they, 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 that technology requires uh, kind of more decision making. What they would rather do is focus on schedules, focus on things like Fitbit watches and activity logs and, and GPSs in all the trucks to sort of assure that they're within their, they, they sometimes can't tell whether they're really asleep if they just use the GPS, but if they use uh, activity monitors. And then the other thing is the truck drivers, uh, truck companies, especially in in uh, Ohio was the groundbreaking. One of the ones down in, in, in Akron just did uh, testing in uh, all, their, all their truckers. 
and they uh, treated their sleep apnea without prejudice. So, because they know that it's very difficult to train truck drivers, to get them, to recruit them, and to just dismiss them because they have sleep apnea, categorically is not what they want to do. Alan Pack had a demonstration project in which he not only did the portable, but he also did the DME. And, and they've since kind of outsourced that to a different company for that. And they said it was pretty, the, the companies were pretty happy with that. And the drivers were generally pretty happy about it. But, but those are a small slice of the truck driving population. The 300,000 that are done in Ohio, many of them are, are, are the, uh, are the, you know, the guys that are delivering the, the produce around the, around the Northeast Ohio. Those are commercial truck drivers. And, and a lot of those guys, um, you know, they, they, some of them are private people. Some of them are smaller companies. They can't afford that stuff. So generally yeah. it's just found to be impractical. And they've done it to also to train. Um, at, w at one time they thought that train uh, operators were very low risk for drowsy driving until they actually put monitors on them. And then they had a high profile, a couple of high profile crashes. Yeah. It just seems it's, it's such a uh, complicated topic, as you mentioned. There's so many other variables that, that play into it. And, um, so one of the guys over in engineering was trying to get a headrest, which would measure your EEG. And, and it's true that your biopotentials uh, can be recorded uh, without putting all these electrodes on people and uh, they're faint signals, but they can be detected and amplified and, 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 and pushed forward. And he was trying to see whether or not that would, that would do anything. He had a driving simulator and I was in it at one time. It made me nauseous. It really, these driving simulators, you, you, I, you, and that's one of the things is that you have to tolerate the driving simulator to actually do the driving simulator. And, the nauseous comes from you really can't see. It's like one of those virtual reality things. It's, it's, you really can't, you really are, you know then that you're using so many, much more when you're driving a car than you are with, with a virtual reality. Good morning, Dr. Stroll, it's Marvin. Yeah. Yes, can you comment on uh, the utility of uh, MWT on this uh, uh, population? And uh, in, in real life, is that still being required by the industry? So, I, you know, when, when we do MWT, um, you'll find it in all the, the the occupational physician recommendations, and you'll find it often in the CDL, uh, in the uh, CME recommendations. They want testing. At one time, they wanted a whole PSG and MSLT, which economically was not viable for uh, individual truck drivers. So the MWT was sort of a sort of one of their things, and it is a good, it's a better test for ability to maintain wakefulness. And it is the reciprocal of the, uh, in general, of the MSLP. However, the problem with it is, is, is that it's a one point in time and whether or not you do two or you do four is not clear. And uh, the criteria though, or, or, or you can pick which one, but if they demand an objective measure of some sort, which they generally won't do if you're a board certified sleep doctor, and you explain what you, you're making your decisions. So I don't think it's, it, it's recommend, it's not recommended by the medical profession. It's only recommended by the uh, medical sleep, the sleep medicine profession. It's only recommended by occupational people who read the literature and say, oh, you've got a test, right? You got a test. And you say, okay, I'll do a test. It's normal. So it's, normal, on it's, that. It, it, it's, it's normal in you. And, yeah, so and guess piggybacking what? on that statement. So if yeah. somebody, if a driver or a, or a pilot comes to you and with a letter, hey, I'm needing 
uh, PSG uh, plus minus MSLT or MWT done. Yeah. And you don't necessarily think that necessarily is helpful. Yeah. So I sent so I, I sent a letter it. back. I sent a letter back to that to that particular to, to saying that. I say that he has a no diagnosis of OSA, so I don't need to reestablish that. He has some degree of sleepiness, which he had originally. Uh, now, if, in the case of a person that has narcolepsy, they, in turn, they, they really shouldn't be driving a truck, right? And so, you know, you, you know, if you suspect narcolepsy and excessive sleepiness, you may, this may be the, the, the reason for why you do uh, another PSG on CPAP with an MSLT is because you suspect narcolepsy. And, and we've had that in the VA. We had people come in and say, well, I've got this sleep apnea and I'm treating and I'm using my my CPAP, and you realize that their that their sleepiness is really terrible, and they had narcolepsy. Mm -hmm. Now the problem with that is, what's your what's your physician patient confidentiality to sit there and say, you know, well, don't worry about his OSA, <laughs> just worry about his narcolepsy. So I think, so the problem you have is you just go back and you say, it's not gonna be useful because one test is not gonna be predictive. The AHI is not predictive. One test of an MS, uh, MWT is not predictive. And it's really the most, which is hardest to prove, the most important thing to, uh, to, to establish is the educational principles that the patient knows, and I usually put that in, that they know about the dangers of drowsy driving. They've experienced poor drive, drowsy performance. They've experienced it, and they have relief with this with their current therapy. And that that particular uh, understanding is, is probably the best, the, the major thing is going to protect them from something else. Okay. So I'm, I just be very, you know, I, I, I don't, I try not, and usually that's accepted. And, but I think it's accepted because I'm a board certified sleep doctor. And I think if you're, if you're not, if you're, if, if you, if you're referred, there, there are people who are, so, so let me, let me tell you who a, a, a commercial medical examiner is. Now they have to take a test and they have to understand uh, regulations and they have to be re pretty good on the literature and they get a sort of a certificate and there are certain ones that do it. But in the wild west about 15 years ago, you could say, well, I do this and you could hang up your shingle and you could say, this is what I do. And all, what you would do is just farm out the consults, farm out the consults for hemoglobin A1C, farm out the consults for, 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 for uh, blood pressure control, uh, some sort of neuropsychiatrical stuff. And, and, you, and then you send it to the specialist and say, well, you tell me whether they can drive a truck, right? And that's what I push back against, Mark. Is that, is that, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. I mean, it's, it's, it's not satisfying because it's not a, you know, sought off bird's nest, but I mean, a bird, bird, uh, a birdhouse, but, which I'm trying to make. I'm trying to make a really good birdhouse. It's hard with a saw, but that's the way it is. Okay, well, I, I, the interactive questions I'll put up somewhere. I, I think they're, they're you know, appropriate to reduce risk of drowsy driving. We can, people have to drop off. All right, so what's appropriate to reduce risk of drowsy driving? You prescribe modafinil, you encourage the patient to phone call to engage conversation and feel sleepy while driving. <laughs> You recommend that patients should uh, open their car window. You recommend that patients should pull over and take a nap if they feel sleepy while driving, or you recommend that the patient should run the air conditioner rather than the heater to keep them alert while driving. So there is a, a there is a, a study which suggests that you should tell them to 
go to the take a nap for 20 minutes. And even better is take a cup of coffee and then take a nap for 20 minutes. Because while they take the nap, the caffeine is going into their body and it'll work for about 45 minutes. Question two, uh, underwent polysomnography, complaints of snoring, day time sleep is, obstructive sleep apnea, 15, denies of being involved, mid-state multiple near misses, continues to drive, only means to get to work, concerned about dry driving, progressive in for treatment and help prevent falling asleep while operating on the vehicle. In addition to warning the patient against drowsy driving, starting CPAP therapy, what other steps should be taken? about other non-OSA causes of daytime sleep is perform an MSLT, start a stimulant therapy, perform an MWT, report to the local Department of Motor Vehicles if the patient has a medical impairment to be ready to the state to offer to drive. So of these, uh, the, the 2013, we said that in addition is to warn, uh, ask about other non-OSA causes. So sleep extension can reduce sleepiness in severe OSA. If they're sleeping for five hours a night and they plan on that, if they can sleep for, or if they can get into bed, I told them to get into bed for uh, seven hours a night, that that'll mitigate their sleep. The sedating drug, sleep extension. Okay. And then question three, uh, diagnosed with sleep apnea, undergoing overnight polysomnography, seizure in the office, coming by his wife, has medical history of hypertension, pre-diabetes, both of which manage with lifestyle, notified by melampotty class three, at birth is nine, after discussing the diagnosis, you consider wrist strap by the patient with drugs. Okay, so which of the following best approach to assess this patient's risk? Assessment should not occur during this visit because the patient does not complain of daytime sleepiness. Assessment should not occur during this visit, which should occur six weeks after the patient started OSA treatment. Assessment should not occur, should occur in this visit, it should consist of directly asking the patient about falling asleep while driving, including actual crashes and near misses. And assessment should occur at this visit, it should start with a discussion with the wife. The patient is agreeable and should allow more objective view of day to day sleep. Well, the answer in the 2013 was really C. That is, because uh, it, it, it's really you know you, you don't know you don't know what information you're going to get from either the, parent, the patient or the wife, but you don't necessarily assume that the wife is more objective. So, the, uh, observed observe, one example is observed apnea is during sleep. What's their AHI? Is an observed apnea during REM sleep a healthy person, or is it observed apnea? Question four is uh, untreated obstructive sleep apnea falls asleep while driving gets into a motor vehicle accident. Which of the following statements is most accurate regarding drowsiness and motor vehicle accidents? And um, motor vehicle accidents due to falling asleep most often include multiple vehicles, not really single vehicles. Review of crashes during Due to drowsy driving, reveal evasive maneuvering just prior to the community, usually no skid marks or evasive activity. Serious injury and death occur less commonly. It's more likely to have mortality, but sleepiness related crashes occur most commonly at night and mid afternoon. The majority of fatal, whatever it is, the majority of fatal motor vehicle accidents are due to drowsy driving. So you just have to realize that. Um, you, you sort of have to be realistic that you have to have all these things in front of you. And, and, you know, in short, you have to be a doctor, not just a sleep doctor. Okay, well, thank you very much. Hopefully this was useful. Uh, and we'll put this 